In 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall marked an historic shift in politics in Europe. The dream of a democratic, united Europe suddenly became a possibility. Education and training was always going to be a crucial area for successful integration. Well, the laws at the, uh, at the time uh, were that Europe was changing very rapidly, that whichever transition to the European model or way of life was to happen, whether it would happen rapidly or not, whether countries should belong to sort of European economic space before joining the European Union. One of the big problems was the discrepancies in social systems, uh, in social legislation, but also in productivity, in qualification. And the law, as a former trade unionist, has always had a very focused and detailed view on edu education and vocational training. It's a way to empower people. And true, in many of the countries, let's say in the neighborhood of what was the European Union at the time, these systems, mostly inherited from communism, uh, were rather weak, not in education, but in personal uh, capital uh, investment. In the five years that it took to set up the ETF, the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia collapsed. Once the ETF opened its doors at Villa Gualino in Turin, it had to decide where its work would be most beneficial. Well, I, I think uh, one of the, the most important points for me was uh, to, to get away from the very specialized and very, uh, let's say, strict education um, um, uh, without any um, connection really to what, uh, what, the, uh, what the needs of the economy are, uh, because of, of course also many uh, companies had been state ruled, uh, uh, but uh, and and how they could also better sell than in the end their, their good projects, uh, and and therefore I, I think there was no other way than than changing really the education and training system fundamentally. By 1999, the ETF geographical remit included the newly independent countries of the former Soviet Union, the Balkans and the southern and eastern Mediterranean. The ETF was heavily involved in the enlargement process. By the end of 2007, with the accession of 12 countries to the EU, the ETF focus shifted. What that actually meant was that the borders of the EU were expanding and that there were more countries then that were on um, EU's borders, ones that ETF could usefully work with in terms of supporting them in the reform of their TVET systems and labour market. And some of those countries were actually very challenging countries to work with, much more so than the 10 new member states were. I think my most memorable moment as director of ETF was undoubtedly the introduction of a new legislative mandate for ETF. Um, the existing one had become out of date. Um, it needed to be um, brought up to date with incorporating the new programmes that had come into place. It needed to be extended to cover new countries that had be, become neighbours of the EU. And um, I wanted this unique resource, which ETF is, um, there isn't another organisation quite like it anywhere in the world. I wanted it to be available to be used by those who could make use of it usefully. That would mean D various DGs within the Commission. It would mean um, partnering with other aid agencies, multilateral bodies particularly. Um, and so it was important for me to get that new mandate in place before I left and I'm very pleased to say that that was achieved. The ETF's new mandate coincided with the build-up and consolidation of the EU foreign affairs policy against the backdrop of global turmoil. The ETF new director arrived with fresh ideas on how to implement the new mission. This brought with it a host of new opportunities for the organization. 2009 it was mainly the year when the mandate adopted in December 2008 by the Parliament was supposed to start being implementing and uh, what was new on that first of all vocational education and training was considered as being part of human capital development so give a broader 
understanding and scope to vocational education and training that in our days is also associated very much with skills development, make sure that you are creating the skills learners, individual citizens as well as the labor market is looking for. So my mission was to uh, make sure that ETF will remain a reference in these areas of human capital development, VAT included, and with policies that are referring to, to labor market. And it was not difficult to work for this vision because there are that many strengths of GTF that allows you to really charter the journey of the organization towards excellence. The ETF will continue to be needed for inspiring, recommending, suggesting ideas for how human capital could remain in the focus as the soft power of the external relations that the EU wants to build. ETF continues to be a valuable source of expertise in human capital development and a point of reference for evidence-based policy making for its partner countries. Today more than ever, its work is crucial in helping partner countries to develop skills for work and for life. If you don't have those skills, if you don't uh, have this uh, qualified uh, education, and if you don't get the possibility to educate yourself through almost uh, whole, your whole life, uh, then you won't reach what we uh, are struggling for. Uh, that people can uh, live good lives, uh, they can uh, uh, have salaries they can live on and uh, they can educate themselves through uh, uh, the whole life. Uh, and if you do that, you also uh, educate uh, your society, uh, the country you are living in. I would wish uh, the, the foundation that can further develop because I am convinced uh, that this kind of institution, not directly uh, at the high political level, but more on the subject-oriented level, makes big sense uh, to help uh, countries to develop well-qualified people, uh, because well-qualified people are really the source uh, of country to improve life and, and uh, yeah, to improve their life. I think the original idea remains valid and if anything, if we had not invented the ETF 20 years ago, we probably should invent it today.